We have uh, Maria Schiaffiti, uh, Regional Manager, MEA Microsoft, to join us, Maria, please. Uh, we have uh, Yuriko Ortica, uh, you can sit over there, uh, from uh, Senior Policy Advisor from EXA, European Community Ship Owners Association. You can hear, uh, you can sit next to me, Yuriko. Uh, we also have Captain um, Eugen Adami from uh, Mastermind Ship Management, uh, Group uh, Director and Owner. Uh, would you like to sit over there, Maria? You and uh, Captain Oyen can sit next to Yuriko. Thank you. We also have uh, Cleo Papadopoulou from PCW. PC, yes, PWC, excuse me, you can join us. Thank you, Cleo. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Stella Kazamias, Interorient Ship Management. Welcome, Stella. And uh, with no uh, uh, delay, uh, let me say how happy I am to be here with you today for this panel. This panel, um, so a, wor a warm welcome to all of you. This panel will address the human element from a cross-professional angle. Uh, last time I was here on this uh, stage uh, for a Cyprus Shipping News uh, event, I had the chance to talk about war risks. Today we will discuss the war for talent, if such a war exists, and uh, we will do our best to explore the topic from a uh, cross-professional and multidisciplinary angle. Now, uh, if you look up in the dictionary, talent is a God's gift. So being in the country of gods, we are very well positioned for talent. Nevertheless, uh, we do have some issues, adequacy of um, uh, seafarers and officers, uh, shortfalls uh, uh, are an issue, and uh, we are here to explore some of the aspects of this challenge. Now, that said, let me say that uh, seafarers and officers uh, benefit from a robust legal regime. MLC uh, was adapted, was amended last year to ensure connectivity. Uh, STCW is under uh, scrutiny. So uh, from the stance of the legal instruments, we are um, in a relatively good uh, position. The challenges ahead will be seen from different angles, as I said before, and uh, I'm very uh, um, pleased to commence the discussion with the first uh, question addressed to you, uh, Yuriko, concerning the challenges that you see in attracting and retaining talent, including uh, young talent and Gen Z in the shipping sector. And please, uh, Captain Eugen, feel free to join us for, this, uh, for the same question. Thank you so much. Um, I think um, uh, this is very relevant. Attractiveness uh, and uh, retention is, is something that is a high priority for the shipping industry, as we all know. We are facing big shortage. Uh, it's not new, but I think it has been aggravated with COVID for sure. And so um, I think uh, the industry has to adapt and evolve. Uh, we have to make it uh, visible for all that uh, there is a commitment towards sustainability, towards digital transformation, and we know that young uh, talent and Gen Z are very much environmental conscious, uh, and, and, and they have unique digital skills, basically almost born with them uh, nowadays. That's something that, that's, that's common to other generations. Mm -hmm. um, we at EXA, we have several initiatives to attract and retain, of course, it's, it's a high priority. Um, we have developed, uh, for instance, uh, a campaign towards uh, young students and also uh, um, even uh, elementary schools to, to make evidence the, 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 that actually shipping is, is more present than they know. So it's really about visibility of, of the opportunities that there is. Uh, we have a 
everything on our website, a, a sort of toolbox with a career booklet with the amount of, of, of careers you, uh, you can take as a maritime lawyer, as an as a engineer, as a seafarer, uh, on board, or ashore. So there is, there is several careers that actually are not visible enough. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, finally, uh, the, the cultural diversity. We know Gen Z is very much uh, uh, committed to, to diversity. Um, and diversity in, uh, in the broad term, I think uh, if we, 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 we actually are committed to, to, to such a to such, uh, topic, we can also bring, uh, bring more young talent there. Absolutely. Uh, what about your stance, uh, Captain Oyen? How can we... Yeah, I, I like the word sustainability, actually, in, in, in this. And if I combine sustainability with mm -hmm. talent, then that also means retention. So I need a high retention rate. Um, by history, European seafarers stayed on board of ships until their age of 32 in average. That is not sufficient. Yeah? So the, the sustainability will tell us a little bit like uh, uh, the Japanese workforce. You know, when in Japan the fire brigade is coming, the people who drive this fire brigade, uh, they are not as young as we expect. Yeah? Some of them are 70 years old and beyond. And that goes a little bit in the direction of sustainability. So we have to think about how we keep our seafarers longer employed of, on board of the vessels Maybe we in the industry, in the shore-based industry, have also to think to work longer to make it to happen. And we have to keep our vessels most likely also longer in order to be really uh, uh, CO2-minded. So I think it's a journey which we have to take, but we have to understand, first of all, what are the real bottlenecks here. And we should not forget in 2050, that is only in a few, in two decades from now. Mm -hmm. In 2050, if we would be in this room, you know what the main topic would be? Depopulation. Yeah? So our amount of people on planet Earth is increasing, is expected to increase only by 2050. And by 2050, it is depopulation. So it's for the next uh, conferences. <laughs> um, Maria, uh, do you identify any best practices uh, in the way um, the industries, not just uh, obviously shipping industry, which is not yours, uh, retain, attract and retain talent? Do you see an appetite in the exchange of knowledge concerning how we can uh, attract and retain talent between industries? Yeah, uh, I think the cultural element is very important. That's why I stress out during my presentation the cultural element. We believe that this is the essence of everything we do. People don't join companies and don't stay in the companies because of the money only. This is, and we saw from Cleo's also presentation, that this is one of the factors, but not the first and the most important factor. They stay there because they feel they are part of something bigger. They feel that they contribute. They feel that they are respected. They feel that they can fulfill their dreams, their ambitions. They have a continuous development. So they can learn. They, they feel that every day they are marketable. So all these elements are super important. And that's why what we believe is something that everyone can take advantage of is this cultural journey, this cultural transformation, and how its company defined its own journey. We don't say that Microsoft, let's say, it's the only example. We have multiple successful examples across the different industries. But let's see how its companies, how its shipping company can form its own cultural journey, what are the key elements uh, he would like to take into consideration, and how these elements, let's say, fit with the people, how people fit mm -hmm. into the culture. And my message to that is, we did 
a huge shift from shifting in the role, shifting in the culture in the company by having this strong cultural aspect. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we can export to other industries. This is what you are Absolutely, suggesting. absolutely. And um, Clio and Stella, uh, I said before that talent is uh, defined as a God's gift. Uh, if you look up in the dictionary, you will also see that the word comes from, uh, it, the word was used as a unity uh, of weight and a unity of uh, currency. Now, what is talent for your organizations? What are your expectations with regard to talent? Cleo. Okay, um, <clears throat> I said before in, in my presentation that uh, employees should be um, recruiting for, for skills wherever necessary, but more importantly, should be recruiting for potential. Um, and I think talent is the appetite to grow, it's the growth mindset, it's the energy and the passion to go above and beyond and do great things, not just for the company, but also for, for yourself. That's, that's my definition of, of talent. Um, now, in, in, in PwC, um, we grow talents. We, we are deemed in Cyprus to be the big school of accountants. So we just breed people, and then the whole industry just takes people from us. Um, and, and we are good at that because we are sort of focusing on three different types of, of, of trainings and, and nurturing this talent. Um, one is the technical, whatever they need to know from a technical perspective. The other one is digital, whatever they need to do learn with technology. And the other one is human skills. As I said, human skills are very, very, very important. And that's actually what will differentiate people from the sort of low level in organization to grow the next leader. So it's, it's where um, the focus should be made. Um, okay, in PwC we have the way of assessing people. Uh, it, it, it's a very complex system and everybody's involved. I, I will only say that from an inclusion and diversity perspective, just to make sure that everybody is treated fairly. I sit on the board um, on the moderation meetings where we assess 1,100 people for their rating and their promotion, just to make sure that nobody is, is, is treated unfairly. So we take you know, fairness um, very seriously because that's what usually will kick talent out. If, if, if they come in mm -hmm. with all the energy and then they feel that they have not been given the opportunities, not properly trained, not fairly treated, then they will just leave. And going back to, to the purpose, I'll just mention an example quickly. Um, there's a lot of people who are leaving organizations and go to work for organizations that have a purpose. And when we talk about purpose, a lot of, of companies are, are talking but are not actually walking the talk. Um, and I had a serious conversation with, with Blair Shepard last week as to, you know, we have a purpose built trust in society and solve important problems. How does an associate and how does that uh, person on a ship knows what the purpose of the company is and how does that person live that purpose every day. So translating the big mumbo jumbo corporate language down into a language that people will understand is very important because people are leaving to go for employees that are working for purpose. And my best... Thank you, Cleo. Yeah, my best friend, my, my, my daughter's best friend, she's an engineer, she left a very big company and went to work for a charity growing bees around the world because that's what her purpose is. So, yeah, talent needs to be retained. Thank you, Cleo, for these meaningful inputs. Uh, Stella Kazamias, uh, Group uh, HR Manager in Terrorient. Yes. Uh, so, what does talent mean for your organization? Um, what are the expectations? Uh, just a couple of words about me, just to give some um, info on my background. I've been with Terrorient for the last 17 years. So, and I started my career with PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, was ages ago. But I've, I've lived through an organization within the shipping industry, so I've developed extra expertise in HR. So I'm passionate about HR, and I've seen um, within shipping specifically, so I've seen the changes um, of the workforce, the trends, the challenges. Um, and you know I, I could talk all day about, about these, and especially the current topics of Zoomers, mm -hmm. talent, war for talent, uh, the competition the fintech competition that, that we're in, in at the moment, um, diversity and inclusion. So when it comes to talent, we cannot ignore the Zoomers right now. They're bringing a lot in the mix. Um, 
As Cleo said earlier, Zoomers will be making up of 30% of the workforce by 2025. So they will be an important element of, of the workforce. So what I've done, instead of spending hours researching and reading you know, um, studies that other companies have done, I've invited them in. We have a lot of, uh, quite of them within the workforce. So I said, come on in, let's talk. I wanna hear firsthand, I wanna hear from you what you expect, what you value, um, what, what are you looking for within organizations? So I've been attending quite of these conferences lately, so I thought I need, to get, I need to get this firsthand. So what we see right now, the Zoomers, the, the, new, the talent nowadays, they're completely different from any generation that we've seen so far. They're the global generation, they're extremely intelligent, they're multi-talented, they're very well educated, they know what they want, um, they will not hesitate to jump they value autonomy and leave me alone, let me get the work done, it doesn't matter where I'm working from. They want real-time feedback, they want meaningful jobs, they want to be involved, so, and I can go on. Uh, but it's really important to understand them. Now, in terms of talent and what we do at Interorian and how we see them, basically talent is the collective skills, abilities, competencies, and potential of, of individuals that will drive the organization forward. The key here is, what do we do about attracting them? Uh, recruiting, onboarding, um, performance management, retaining, um, keeping them engaged, and keeping them involved. So I just wanna highlight a few of the things we do in these areas, and I wanna be able to give back to you some practical examples of what we do in-house. So first of all, Shipping industry is perceived as an industry with not a lot of glamour. So I think, first of all, we need to be doing some work collectively in, a, in making the business and making the industry a lot more attractive than it already is. We need to add the sparkle to it. So there is work that needs to be done collectively. And then individually as organizations, we need to be investing in our employer branding, in fun corporate cultures, and showcasing case studies of what we do and how we do it. When it comes to recruitment and onboarding, we need to be hiring for diversity. My co-panelists spoke about culture fit, and I will dare to talk also about culture add. It's not about just people fitting in, but also about bringing in people that are different. Um, and they can bring in a new set of ideas, fresh ideas, and different ideas. Um, in fact, at Interorian, diversity is one of our competitive advantages, and I'm very proud to talk about this. It's, it's um, something that it's the hot topic in the in the recent years but for us it's been there from the beginning it's how we it's, it's embrace we embrace it and it's within our corporate culture um, for example in terms of onboarding we have the buddy scheme that we assign all new recruits with uh, the go-to person the buddy to walk through them during the onboarding uh, phase um, performance management, we need to be looking at offering international experience to them, personal, personalized development plans, uh, putting them on fast-track fast, fast track career programs, so we need to be looking at these individuals, uh, the talents, um, at, as standalone cases and be able to customize their personal development plans, mentoring, coaching, um, retaining them, so looking at the reward schemes, Wellness programs and uh, you know wellness initiatives are very important to them. Work-life balance, and I'll be talking a little bit about yeah. practical examples. Um, fun corporate cultures, and what I've done with our talent is obviously keeping them involved, which makes them feel, and they become the corporate ambassadors and the corporate influence influencers, as we would like to call them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes. Thank you. Um, and um, concerning um, the transformation that was mentioned before, uh, um, Urigo, more specifically digital and uh, environmental transformation, from your stance uh, as the ship owners, uh, EXA, what challenges do you see in the capacity of the human element to adapt to this uh, twin uh, revolution? Yeah. Uh, thank you. It's it's true that um, I mean, digital transformation, and green transition is across sectors uh, big a big impact uh, for for 
for um, for even for our modern way of life, and I don't think the shipping industry has been spared. Uh, and clearly, uh, as we already heard today, it's it's something that we have to really consider for for the our workforce. Uh, and so um, I think uh, it's it's really important for um, for for um, for the seafarers because we know by the next decade, and this is a study that we commissioned last year. By the next de decade, 800,000 seafarers would have to upskill in order to cope with the carbon um, carbon transition and reducing of the carbon footprint. So uh, it's not a small number. So what, what can we do? So we know STCW at IMO is being reviewed, is on the way, but we also know that it's a long process. Uh, it's not something, IMO is not known for, for changing from one day to the other. Um, so we also have to take stock here uh, as an industry, and we, and I say we now because I already learned what you said to me before, uh, we really have to, 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 to understand that uh, the need for, for, uh, for, for go beyond STCW. Mm -hmm. the, uh, mention, the mention that you have made to the recent amendment of uh, MRV regulation by uh, the amending regulation that will subject maritime transport to EU ETS is highly relevant yeah. and indicative of all the changes that we have been experiencing. Indeed, no, I'm happy clearly, that you have mentioned this. UETS and fuel EU, so lots of new regulatory uh, measures taken by the EU are being now enforced as of January. Ship owners will have to, to yeah. pay for the training system. We have new fuels being implemented ammonia, batteries, batteries hydrogen, uh, biofuels, to, to name a few. So, what, you know, what's the safety risks there? Uh, we have really to, 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 to understand that there is a need for reskilling. And so, and so this is really where we center and to go beyond SCCW to have you know, vocational training uh, through, uh, we have a project called SkillC, we're very proud of that one. Uh, it's, a, it's a project that basically uh, um, um, understand the gaps between the offer and the demand, the offer uh, uh, be, being, uh, be, being also in a collaboration with the maritime training institutions. And so we have educational package, everything free of charge. Uh, so you can just go to, to, to our website, you can download, download uh, educational packages with training courses on green skills, on digital skills, fuel, uh, fuel management. And so it's, 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 it's really important to take stock also as an industry to, to understand that we cannot wait for, for, um, for new uh, STCW uh, minimum standards. We have to, to, okay. to, to get ready for that. Excellent. Um, obviously, all the roles uh, are impacted by uh, the digital and environmental uh, transformation. Uh, Captain Oiken, do you see uh, a change uh, in leadership roles uh, resulting from uh, the transformation under discussion? Yeah, um, you know, um, leadership is a talent by itself, and uh, that will not change. What will change are the tools which leaders have to embrace in order to lead. And we have great tools. Um, sometimes we mix these tools with the terminology digital transformation. These are different things. So the digital transformation would mean that I take a manual process and I replace that manual process by a digital process. Uh, that is difficult in the shipping industry to really achieve when we include the seafarers because we need connectivity, we need connectivity all the time, etc., etc. But what I want to say is uh, the regulatory framework is there. So MRV, ETS, all these things are there. And from the legal perspective, we will see the aftermath of non-compliance. What we should embrace, however, is a positiveness here. We want to save CO2 emissions. That is why we have regulations. So how do we do that? By embracing the seafarers, by making the seafarers part of the issue. So on board of the vessel, they need to have a very good idea of how much fuel they shall spend on the voyage, 
and then they shall perform the voyage in collaboration with the charters and with the office as a team. And then you will see that our workforce will adjust the speed of the vessel, they will adjust the engines, and the ultimate goal will be lower emissions. Mm -hmm. But it is a team building exercise. We need really to embrace the guys yeah. on board. And this presupposes, of course, that we have adequate uh, seafarers and officers. How has your organization addressed the problem of uh, shortages of uh, officers? Yeah. Training is my passion, and recruiting of, of, of people is uh, default. So. We have to train, like, I mean, I have been trained as a cadet. I have been trained all the years by my mentors. I'm being trained today by you. Yeah? So training is an ongoing process, and we have to do that with our workforce on board, meaning we shall not, because of COVID, have no cadets. There was no reason to stop your cadet scheme. There was a reason to scale down um, training on shore because of the institutions were closed. Yeah? But you could have your cadets on board and you could continue with the KVH connectivity with what the other guys have. You could continue with your onboard training. So what, what I did, all our vessels have at least four cadets. And this is depending not on economics or whatsoever, it is a default. If I want to have a master, I have to put a cadet into the pipeline. And I have to make sure there is no leakage in my pipe so that I can achieve all that what Stella mentioned. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So you, you, you need to feed continuously the pipeline, meaning we should have very large scale um, cadet ships irrespectively if you retain the cadet or not. If the cadet later goes to another company and he is well educated and he will meet my vessel in the middle of the ocean, maybe we avoid a collision. It doesn't matter where the guys are. It is clear that the human element is embedded in all aspects of uh, shipping, yes. uh, including maritime safety, marine environment protection, and um, the unattractive aspects of uh, life uh, at sea um, are probably one of the reasons uh, which may explain uh, a certain difficulty in attracting uh, uh, enough people to this uh, exciting job. Now, that said, uh, this brings us to work-life balance, which is obviously an, a challenge also for uh, personnel ashore, not only for people at sea. And um, I would like to ask uh, uh, Cleo and uh, Stella, uh, what challenges do you see uh, concerning uh, work-life balance and well-being? Cleo? Okay, as I said, I call it work-life integration because it's, it's no longer, now I work and now I live. It's, I mean, COVID has been a push into the future in actually accelerating mixing work with, with, uh, with life. Um, I think today it's a lot easier than when I was growing up my kids um, to actually balance the needs of the family and, and, and the needs of work. I went through very, very rough times and um, thank God now people don't need to and women don't have to go through that. Um, but it's down to employers to actually complement and make that easier for, for people to mix work and, and life. And, and I'll just say a few things of what we do internally, PwC maybe, that resonates with some of you. Um, we have what we call the flex menu. So you have flex day, flex week, flex place, flex year. So you can work anytime during the day, have as many breaks as you like. Um, you can work one day a few hours and then work overtime the next day to fill in the hours of the week. You can work from whatever you want. Um, I was working yesterday remotely from my hotel room. Um, you can have a, a flex year, take a sabbatical or take leave and paid leave for as long as you want just to attend to whatever you want to do. Um, there's also a review menu, which means reduced hours, um, 
job sharing, so you can have a job, then you have someone working in the morning and someone taking over in the afternoon uh, and reduce hours in, in the year. Um, additional parental leaves for people to, to take. Um, I keep saying that expanding maternity leave is, is wrong because you're actually um, ruining women's careers. You need to increase, parental, increase um, paternity leave so that it's equal to maternity leave and then you have <laughs> equal um, absence from work if you want to have gender equality in the workplace. Um, we have lots of activity clubs um, so people can have fun outside work. I'm actually leading a Zumba club. I'm a Zumba instructor, so I do that every evening after we finish work. Uh, on mental health, we have um, in-house psychologists for support of the people, an open line for people to report anything they want. Um, we have meditation sessions every day. Um, and Coach Me, which is we have professional coaches with PwC, people can go to for 10 minutes, half an hour, and, and sort of air their, their problems. A nutritionist, parental advisor, and in the summer we have four-day week, which means we work Monday to Thursday, and we have long weekends for July and August. Mm -hmm. Stella? Um, again, yes. So in an industry that operates 24-7, I would say work-life balance kind of gets replaced with shipping being a lifestyle, a job in shipping, in the shipping industry. So for us, being within, in, within this industry, as an employer, focusing on wellness, well-being initiatives, and promoting initiatives on work-life balance is an integral part of our commitment to be a responsible human employer. So we've been doing this not now, but we started focusing 15 years ago on putting, putting in place practices that focus on wellness and promoting work-life balance. I'll share a few of the things that we do. So we've established the Employee Wellness Committee 15 years ago with the aim of focusing on mental health, physical, social, um, overall well-being. And companies don't need to have committees. They can even have an officer looking after matters like this. So this committee focuses basically on um, organizing wellness weeks, on uh, focusing on various um, current topics on mental health, nutrition, physical uh, health being. Uh, we have an in-house gym, so for companies that can't afford having an in-house gym, they can consider this. Otherwise, they can have subsidized yoga classes or subsidized yoga um, gym memberships. We've got a wellness newsletter that goes out uh, um, monthly that touches various topics on, on wellness. For companies that subsidize snacks or lunches, they need to be looking at focusing totally on healthy um, uh, plans. We have challenges, wellness challenges, like um, water challenge or steps challenge. Um, yeah, so this on the, uh, in the area of, uh, of what the Wellness Week looks after. We need to be looking at workload and, and, demand, and workload demands, and the managers need to be close enough with the, the team members to um, balance this out, looking at deadlines, um, and employees need to have a say how they work and how they want to manage their own work. And now coming to normalizing extended time off and encouraging time, time away from work. So it's okay to talk about it, but we need to actually implementing it. And I'm telling you, it doesn't cost anything. We spend a lot of time finding those, um, those uh, extra initiatives that we can give them that doesn't cost a thing. For example, um, extended time off. If people need to take care of a sick family member or having any, any sort of personal needs that makes them, you know, they need to take time off, we need, we need to be able to do that. Um, giving time off for birthdays, giving time off for attending some, you know, blood donation drives, getting married, adopting children, um, for example, or fertility treatments. Um, we give time off for, for, for initiatives like this. Um, if people need to take time off for, you know, um, sickness, it's okay and they shouldn't feel that they need to work from home while being sick. Early closings, it doesn't cost to close the office early on um, important, let's say, um, celebrations like, I don't know, uh, the day before 15th of August. Uh, sabbaticals, obviously, if companies can afford to give time off for sabbaticals. Um, hybrid working arrangements and uh, definitely the HR function being close okay. to 
uh, employees for support. Yes, yes, Captain Oyen. Um, Within our time constraints, obviously. Yeah, that's right. um, well being on board of the ship and well being in the office are different things. Yes. Rightly for, said. For, for the well being on board of the office, we can do what Stella said. For the well being on board of the vessel, first and foremost, we have to understand the seafarer is away from the family. So if we want to enhance well being on board, we have to foster the link between the seafarer and the family. For that, we need connectivity. For, net, we, for that, we need systems which allow the seafarer to remain close to the family. Here, I would hope that technology will kick in and it will make it for the seafarers affordable to have an equal, similar technical means to stay in touch with the, with the families. Uh, absolutely. The legislator did its job last uh, year by amending MLC, which is uh, the uh, legal, which provides the legal framework for decent working and living conditions aboard. That said, uh, we need to see the amendments entering into force, which will happen by December uh, 2024, and then we'll have to see how the industry will adapt as this is uh, as an area which uh, raises a number of issues. Uh, we all agree that um, uh, a safe ship is a happy ship, and a happy ship has happy seafarers aboard. Um, and uh, since we're talking about happiness, I think gender balance uh, has a role to play. And let me ask uh, Yuriko and uh, Maria, uh, who come from different sectors, how do you see uh, gender balance uh, in this uh, discussion on uh, attracting uh, yeah. enough and the right people in the sector? Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think we come from different sectors, but uh, uh, I think it's clear that, uh, that women uh, bring unique skills, uh, creativity, leadership, uh, they foster innovation, and ultimately in my sector, I think it will uh, if we enhance the participation of women, it will bring more competitiveness to the to the EU shipping sector. So clearly, uh, this is this is very important for us. Uh, um, not only it's not only about gender balance, or uh, it's it's more than that. It's 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 really uh, to bring uh, th these unique skills that that we are lacking. If I remember well, that uh, it was two years ago that we met in Brussels when you had. Uh, you had organized uh, the presentation of a project that was focused on gender this, equality in shipping. This is one of the, the, the practice, the best practice that uh, I, I can share with you very briefly, conscious of time. Mm -hmm. That is, it, it, it was a big project where we, we, we commissioned the report to, to enhance the participation of women, actually. And so we, do, we did came, come out with, um, with, with several action points and, and policy actions for regulators. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, I mean, to name a few, and something that has been tackled by MLC uh, um, in the last revision that will be implemented next year, it's, it's um, uh, that facilities on board the ship should be uh, woman-friendly. Also, the, the protective gear should be shaped in a way that is woman-friendly. These little things, it seems, it seems, it seems very, very small, but ultimately, on the long term, it can have an impact also. And we, we have also, we are collaborating next year with the, the, the Belgian presidency of the council that starts in January next year. And we, uh, we will reward, we are creating this award, this honor that will reward the, the best organization, the best initiative, the best program in terms of diversity, in terms of gender equity. Uh, and, um, and so I think it's this, this best practices that we want to be disseminated in order to, mm -hmm. to bring this um, to, yeah. to a higher level. And personal protective equipment had given rise to an amendment of MLC also. Indeed. Uh, as a result of, uh, the, of lessons, learned, uh, lessons learned entailed by COVID. Uh, Maria, a few words uh, since we are uh, yeah, yeah. under pressure. And I we mean, have to say something about artificial intelligence and uh, yeah. the human element before we close the session and have questions. One thing that I would like to make clear that uh, gender, um, let's say, uh, diversity, it's part of the overall diversity and inclusion initiative. For us, it's one of the three pillars that support our cultural concept of growth mindset, so no doubt about that. Of course, we live in an industry where 
uh, it's mainly dominated, I would say. Uh, in any case, Microsoft is very intentional to increase uh, gender diversity. So we have improved that uh, by five points the last five years, one point every year. We, across the whole uh, population of Microsoft, we are more than 30%, something like 33%. Mm -hmm. And at the executive level, 27%. So one thing is to be intentional in terms of hiring. So expect from the recruiters to come up with a list of candidates that includes always women and be intentional on in that, even in the short list. And in some cases, we might delay the hiring because really we want them to go out and find women, even outside of the sector. Of course, it depends on the type of the job, is technical or business. It's, it's easier for business, it's more difficult for the technical. The other thing is how you increase the pool. So what is the pool you, you get the candidates? We work on different incent, uh, programs, initiatives with the universities, etc. Because the first thing is to increase the pool of the candidates, the STEM candidates. The other thing is what Stella mentioned before. One thing is to attract the women. The other thing is how to retain women. And it's super important to have the right programs. All of these programs that Stella mentioned before in Clio are part of our programs as well. <laughs> the family caregiver program for emergencies, the flexible work style, the ability to, to do your own uh, program on a daily basis as long as you deliver on your targets. All these small things are super important. And also the way that we drive the inclusion part internally. It's not only about having the diversity, but having the policies and having the practices to be inclusive. And a change of mind, mindset. Exactly. Um, and the elephant in the room is, is women in leadership. I think a lot of companies are doing a lot, and you have a lot of diversity all the way up until you get to the board, where it's, it's a very, very low percentage. Um, I mean, yeah, I can talk for hours for that, but that's something that needs to be addressed. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, it has to do with the internal programs of developing women. Uh, the, the mentoring part is super important, I mean, to have mentors for women, because sometimes women feel that, okay, I cannot go there because it's something that I cannot reach, or it's something I don't want to have because I couldn't have um, a balance with my family. So we are intention, intentional in terms of uh, driving mentorships and driving mentorship with women that might have a bit of a balance in this case and they can show to them that it's feasible. It's not easy, but it's feasible. So all these things are small things that help women to dream big in some cases, yeah, because yeah. another, I think, obstacle for women is that they don't uh, dream big and they feel that it's not for us. Um, and also, step by step, things improving. I'm very positive always. I, I always say that, you know, if, if, you, if we only talk about mentoring women, we're just focusing on one side of the issue, it's fixing the system that is stopping women from progressing. I think a lot of women have a lot of passion and a lot of dreams and think big, it's just the system just keeps them down. But you know, let's just... That sounds... We can spend time <laughs> yeah, yeah, talking yeah. about that. All of us are super passionate. Me and Maria, I have to tell you, at Interorian, 50% of the um, top management positions are held by women. But um, again, this starts from the management and the owners. It has Absolutely. to be cascaded from top down. Leadership, uh, leadership. let's say the word from the, from the top, the way that you drive every aspect of the business, it's super important. It's not one process and that fixes all. It has to do with these little steps. And it's ongoing. Exactly. Uh, let me ask you, please, a short statement about artificial intelligence and the human element not more than 30 seconds, please, so that we can accommodate questions from our, uh, uh, from the room. Please. Well, uh, in such a short time, maybe what I just can say is that the digital transition has to be human-centered. So we should be, uh, it will create new job opportunities, better work-life balance, uh, but also some new uh, safety issues. Uh, and also uh, in terms of liability, which you certainly share with this being also a maritime lawyer, uh, that, you, that, you, that you know that who will be responsible in case of automated tasks and, 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 and vessels. So I think it has to be human, human um, uh, centered. centered. And that's, that's actually uh, how, how I would like to leave it. It's a great statement. It's a jurist, <laughs> I totally approve. Uh, artificial Antelogia. intelligence should be a tool and not a solution. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the people should understand the topic first. 
So you need to be intelligent, and then you can have some artificial intelligence to make certain processes better. But be intelligent <laughs> first. Maria, uh, I would stick to what I said during my presentation. Artificial intelligence for sure is going to change many things, and also and it's changing many things. And this is the first time that I see soft skills to come up as so strong, as mandatory, as so important, as never before, because of artificial intelligence. You can make the difference um, if you have creativity, collaboration, resilience, all the skills. And these skills give you the, so the solid base to mm -hmm. develop further other skills. So yes, it's here, but it's not going to replace the human element. It's gonna augment, let's say, what we do today. We gonna make us even more productive and give us more time to focus on other aspects like what we discussed before. Cleo, thank you, Maria. Uh, I'll be very quick. I think uh, AI is very fashionable right now. It's, it's not gonna go away. It's gonna grow much bigger. We, we need to learn to live with it. It's gonna replace certain jobs, but it's gonna enhance others and certain skills, as, as Maria said, yeah, need to be uh, retained for, for humans. Uh, Stella? Ilian, I think we've covered. <laughs> further to add <laughs> on this, covered. but I see Adon is pressing for the time. So. Nevertheless, uh, you are free to share a short statement if I'm, you want. I have nothing further to add. Okay. On this. Uh, I think uh, it, that would be great to have a few questions from the audience. This is the best part, and uh, it's the part which is always under pressure since uh, uh, there are so many things that... Uh, Yes, please. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I have actually one question to, um, to uh, maybe uh, Microsoft and uh, PwC here. Yeah? Because um, when we work in the service industry, as uh, I'm talking about our office staff now, actually, not the seafarers, but we talk about the office staff, and uh, we talk about this flexibility, and uh, people can work at any time. Our people can also work at any time they want. But the problem is we are serving some clients, and the clients got the idea that I'm also, they are flexible and they are working at eight o'clock in the evening and start contacting the service provider and expect the service provider have somebody sitting eight o'clock uh, evening answering them. Uh, how, how do you actually solve this with your, in PwC and Microsoft? You also on your business side or your sales side or support side yeah. or whatever. How, how, how do you, the flexibility for your employees, but your customers also have the flexibility, okay. yeah? Let me address that. I've been in different positions. I, I am mainly in sales, and uh, for many years I was driving services for Microsoft Greece. So we had exactly this challenge. Uh, by saying being flexible, it means that depending on the job also. So when we have to, to drive, let's say, to provide services to a specific client, and you need to collaborate with some people there, of course, you have to be at the customer's office 9 o'clock in the morning and spend the necessary time. But you know, what we say is that every day is not the same. And there are tasks when can be remotely uh, driven, and there are tasks where you, have be, uh, you can be on site. What we say that you have to fle the flexibility to do that. Or when I have a customer meeting, of course I am at the customer side, meeting my customer and spending the necessary time. But when I write a proposal or I drive something else, I can be at home, I can be in Skopelos in my uh, country house, and do that, it does not matter. Or when I have conferences calls, it does not matter. So this flexibility gives me, let's say this style, this hybrid styles give me the flexibility I need. First thing, you have to adjust based on the job needs, but let's be out, let's say think out of the box when it comes the other tasks. Thank you. Uh, do we have the chance for a last question? The very last. <laughs> Who would like to ask the very last question and bring the session to official close? No, they are totally covered, which is uh, which supports. Uh, Thank you very the much. Can I ask a question to Microsoft? Uh, uh, <laughs> at the, at the, at the your, coffee break. Uh, what is the retention rate? How long are people working in Microsoft? Up to what age? What is the average age? Uh, I don't have the data to share with you, but uh, we are seeing um, an increase in average, let's say, age right now. Uh, and we would like to retain people. We would like to have a healthy blend, let's say. 
from people who work for Microsoft a long time. I've been working with Microsoft 26 years, so I'm an example, changing 10 different roles. So that's another you can opportunity have I have internally. Coffee break. And uh, same time, we would like some new blood because this mix drives the, the culture and also uh, progresses the way that we do business. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, here we go. Thank you. Thank you.